Buenas, ¿me, me escuchas? Hola. Hola, ¿qué tal? Aquí preparado ya con todo el, todo el material. Le he mandado a mí también la, la invitación. Sí, estoy aquí, me veo también en YouTube, estamos en directo, ¿no? Creo que estaba ya live, sí. Uh, Perfecto. Um, when we start, I'll just make uh, Raúl um, one minute. Um, so in our meetup uh, page and our Twitter page, uh, introduce you, uh, Nick as well. If he's coming, I'll yeah, read the message. Okay. And uh, then um, I actually put you first. Um, I'll go second with um, Kator, and uh, Nick will go uh, last with uh, Flo. Sounds good. Perfect. Yeah, I have about um, 30 minutes or so of content plus QA. So that should probably work in the schedule if uh, I don't know if it's very strict. Otherwise, I think it's pretty, uh, pretty flexible. So it's something online, right? So uh, people, uh, I'm, I'm, this is an experiment, as I mentioned. I'm not sure how that would work. So um, people might uh, check it later, right? Because we will uh, repost it on, on another channel. So. Uh, they can like forward or go backward to to any other part and skip it or or um, rewatch it. So I would say yes, feel absolutely flexible about it. Sounds good, perfect. And also be uh, I'll be watching the YouTube uh, chat in case there's any questions uh, popping up. So I'll be answering them. In it anyway, if uh, um, I see anything, I can let you know. But if you're checking that as well, that's perfect. I'm actually gonna have my iPad on one side, and my I'm gonna be coding with my computer, so I could I can check if uh, anybody's uh, asking any questions. Sounds good. Perfect. with Nick if he's joining now or not. Here. Hey, Nick. Hey, man. How's it going? <coughs> Good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yeah, man. Yeah. Right. 
So I think uh -huh. you haven't met before, uh, Nick and uh, Raul, two speakers of today. Uh, cool, man. How's it going, man? Good, dude. Yeah, you got a green screen or something, dude. That looks cool. <laughs> that looks really cool. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Well, uh, considering the current circumstances, uh, not too bad, I guess. What about you guys? Very good. Same here. Yeah. Just at home. <laughs> all day at home. Yeah, I'm, actually, my life didn't change at all. I, I work remotely. <laughs> so I just like everything just stayed the same. There was a few a few more dead bodies along the along the road to my work, but other than that, it was normal. Still got pizza, the beer, beer, and, so, right? still got pizza, beer, and and Kotlin meetup. So, you know, what else do you need, man? You know? <laughs> pizza is gonna be, I think, probably the first meetup we have without pizza in a few years. Not for me, man. I don't know if Raúl has any. I don't, unfortunately. I'm even drinking tea. <laughs> I actually ate pizza today. <laughs> Yeah, so I have my my share of pizza already. <laughs> is it just us three talking, or is it somebody else? That's uh, somebody that is uh, seeing the uh, YouTube live, right? Uh, yeah, we have uh, twenty people now. All oh, right, so people are watching us right now, are they? Yeah. Oh, They're watching you as you're eating your pizza and barking. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, well. We can probably start uh, if, uh, uh, since um, everything is going to be recorded, if anybody wants to watch the sessions afterwards, they can do that. So uh, for everybody there and everybody that watches the stream later, thanks for coming. This is an experiment from, from our side. Uh, due to the current circumstances, we decided to have a an online meetup and um, um, yeah, um, let's see how how this works and how you feel about it. And today I was lucky enough to convince uh, two uh, um, great speakers. You know one of them already, and uh, the other one I think it's uh, new in this community. Raúl Raja from Forty Seven Degrees and uh, Nick uh, Skelton, um, freelance Android developer and GD. And um, I'll be talking as well. Um, yeah, Raul will start. Uh, uh, will open the the meetup uh, talking about type groups and functional programming for the Kotlin type system. Um, I'll be talking about uh, stress backend development with Kator, and Nick will present his latest learnings about Kotlin flow. Um, so, if uh, you people have any question, just feel free to write it on the. Um, on the YouTube uh, channel, and uh, we are able to see them, and uh, we'll be happy to jump into any question you have and any other comment. Just feel free to post it up there. So, uh, yeah, without further delay, Raúl, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm very grateful to be here. Uh, thank you the, for uh, the Munich uh, Kotlin meetup for inviting me. And also, we are taking advantage of this opportunity uh, to speak about a similar concept I spoke at Microsphere uh, last week could, that uh, unfortunately couldn't be properly recorded. So this video, I hope it serves uh, to clarify some of those uh, concepts as well. What we're going to be talking today about is about type proofs or uh, propositions as types and proofs as programs. And these are essentially a way in which we can encode uh, new powerful features in the Kotlin type system using the basic principles upon which functional programming is built on. So my name is uh, Raul, and as Enrique mentioned, I worked at 47 Degrees, and I've been working in the last couple of years in the Kotlin compiler and working in the maintenance of the Aero library, which is a library for functional programming in Kotlin, as well as uh, Aero Meta. And the features you're going to be seeing here today, they're not only going to be available as compiler plugins for you to use after Kotlin 1.4, 
but they would also be available as keeps uh, to the language in case there is any interest in adopting on any of these in mainstream Kotlin. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to learn about is that propositions can be seen uh, as types. There's a direct relationship between uh, combinatory logic and set theory or the theory of uh, types. And we can see here uh, this relationship in which in logic, if we have both A and E, sorry, both A and B, uh, that implies we have B and A. And this could be easily encoded uh, in any language that has tuples or uh, functions with two arguments uh, by proving this type of relationship. This is telling us something important. There is a direct relationship between logic and implication and that that we encode in computers programs. So the other part of uh, this notion is that proofs are programs. And we can uh, obviously see here that for the example that we were seeing before, uh, we can potentially just write a Kotlin function that will satisfy this uh, uh, condition. And now we see here the direct relationship between what we write in a programming language and the Boolean logic implications that some of those statements has in terms of the types and how they uh, relate with each other. So everything I'm telling you is something called the curry hower correspondence, which has a third part, which is uh, the Lambex uh, correspondence. And this correspondence is basically nothing but saying that there is a direct relationship between logic or set theory and also category theory. We see here in this uh, diagram the same notion as we saw before in logic and we saw in a potential encoding of a program. Uh, we see here uh, in terms of category theory. If we notice there is A, B, uh, and we can call those objects, those objects represent types in the category of the Kotlin type system, and they have arrow drawn uh, from them that show the same relationships we are seeing above. If we have both A and B, we can obtain B or A, um, but we can also obtain B and A. So this uh, might sound a little cryptic, but it's gonna make uh, a lot of sense pretty soon once we get to the most uh, important part, which is implication. So there is uh, some of these rules that we are uh, seeing, uh, they manifest themselves in many parts of the language. For example, the one we said that A and B, uh, we can see that encoding in a language like Kotlin as a data class for a tuple or a pair, we can see the one for the introduction that if we have A and B, therefore we have A and B as an implication, that is our constructor. And then by elimination, each one of the fields that will access uh, these values in the type system. So we yet see more uh, the uh, relationships between what people are using in logic and people are using in other parts of uh, type and set uh, theory. Uh, in what we actually encode in our languages uh, such as Kotlin. But the most important one of them all is that in Kotlin, subtyping can be seen as an implication. If you notice in the diagram uh, above, you can see what we will look like a standard uh, subtype Kotlin uh, hierarchy or, in, or that of any other language like Java or perhaps uh, Scala that supports subtyping. So we have on the top a number, and then we have other subtypes of that number. But here comes the challenge. Some of these types cannot be extended because they are final, they are sealed, like in this case, int. This relationship of positive int and negative int will never be possible because int is a sealed type that is either in the standard library or in the JDK. And these types are final, uh, but they cannot be extended. So while subtyping is the same as implication in logic in terms of Kotlin, we know by the curry hower correspondence that this rule of implication is not that of per se that it has to be through a subtype relationship, but also that a function can bridge that gap. That is, if we have a function that takes us from positive end to end, 
we can potentially ad hoc enhance these types to give them new meanings. And this is what we're gonna see today with these uh, demonstrations. In this example with code, we can see here uh, that there is a, you know, a third party model for an account, uh, has an abstract interface uh, called combine. And this abstract interface will be expressed basically what in functional programming people call monoid, in which it has a, an empty value or an entity empty value. And also it has an association like plus to combine. And then we can prove the account can actually implement the combination through an external uh, proof or interface or class, which is not actually extending uh, directly combined. In this case, we can also prove that the account can acquire, acquire the behaviors of combined account and the behavior of the constructors of the interface account. And we see here that it's failing because there's no real proof that those functions are as such. The new type proof system, as you see here, extends, uh, we can use the extension annotation to project all of the members of combine directly over account. And now those members become available immediately over syntax over any of the types. This allows us to replace subtype relationships by composition where needed, uh, providing a proof you can go from one type uh, to another. And this system collaborates with the Kotlin type checker as a compiler uh, plugin to pretty much give you what you're seeing here is a more powerful ability than type classes themselves, but is the notion of drawing any arbitrary arrows from any two types to project extension behaviors from one type to another. The next feature we're gonna be uh, looking into it's gonna be union types. So union types, uh, we can think of them as uh, the potential choice of a value of either two types. In this case, we are choosing either an in or a character. So we can see when we create a union that the actual inhabitants of this uh, potential expression might contain all the range of values that characters have as well as all the range of values that integers uh, may have. So what does it look like, for example, in code? Here, we are going to say we have a similar example, response with success and failure, which models the typical case of an ADT. Uh, and we are having a union to type. And as you can see, the union can coerce uh, the type on, or the value on the right directly without using the constructors implicitly. This is because we have provided yet proofs that any value in a polymorphic context like A, in this case is success, can go to the first position of a union given there is a proof that you saw expanded before when we were seeing first and second in the animation. Another property of union types is that union types are commutative. What that means is that union types uh, doesn't matter how you combine them, uh, whether it's left to right or right to left. If you have a union or of an int uh, or characters, uh, and if you have a union of characters or ints, it ends up being the same. Because once uh, the number, as we can see in this diagram, the number of inhabitants is gonna be all of the ones from both int and character. This means uh, that unions are not the same as the data type either, as many people get confused sometimes uh, with. Unions are, don't have a bias, so they treat all of their positions equally. Additionally, unions are associative. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you have uh, a union that uh, appends first uh, with another union that is of a different type. And then those two unions merge into a bigger one in different order. As we can see here again, they still preserve um, the property that all of the inhabitant values within the union are all the possible range of values. So nesting doesn't really 
uh, apply as much since here we are having basically int character or boolean in both cases. So here is a quick example. Oops. Yes. The other property before we go to the example is the unions have a neutral uh, element. So this in Kotlin will mean that unions uh, will, uh, in a way, if you have an int or nothing, that implies you just have int. And that is also true when you combine unions uh, of different types. For example, in this case, we're going to see in the demo, we have here uh, two cases of success for the union, and we see that union two of two successes is the same uh, as just uh, success. We can replace the value for success. Uh, we see here part of the ID integration in which the union is collapsed. And this pointless value, again, if it was uh, pointed to one of the upper bounds, which in this case is either success or response, it automatically coerces respecting the subtype uh, semantics of the Kotlin language. Uh, if there is any questions, feel free to shoot them over the chat. I'm looking at uh, YouTube and other places, so uh, I'll be happy to answer while I'm going through some of these features or after the talk. The next feature we're going to look at is uh, type refinements. Uh, something we built uh, for type refinements is uh, the ability to further constrain a type, not just by its base primitive type, but Boolean conditions that will allow you to get a more precise uh, type when you are attempting to do domain modeling, such as representing positive ints and types that usually languages uh, don't, don't cover. Uh, there is, uh, in this case here, in this uh, animation, we see where we're constraining the int type, and we are constraining it by two predicates. The first one, it says that int has to be greater or equal to zero. And the second, that it has to be uh, even. So at that point, we are uh, selecting a really precise uh, type. Uh, there is a question I'm going to answer before I move forward. Marvin is asking on YouTube, can we use these great features already? On when are they planned for release? So these features are currently available as a, a snapshot form in Arrow Meta but they will be available for release once the Kotlin 1.4 backend becomes uh, stable and IR becomes the, the default backend system for the Kotlin compiler. So these features rely on Kotlin IR as well as Jetpack Compose does and many other uh, frameworks. So we're waiting for that to become stable to do the first uh, stable release following the Kotlin compiler lifecycle then you will be able to use them uh, as a stable. For the moment, you can use them if you want in a snapshot by depending on Kotlin 1.3.7.2, which is the latest supported version of Meta because of this issue with IR that I mentioned. There's another question for Mario. Is it correct that a union type can replace option either? If so, how would you unwrap the value? The typical when value sum, nothing, none, something, okay. So the question is, does union types replace option or either? They do not. I mean, uh, nullable types replace option because option is a nonsense construct in Kotlin given Kotlin has nullable type uh, native support with a faster runtime, but not a union types. If union types were introduced in Kotlin, they wouldn't be introduced potentially in the type system hierarchy which implies that a nullable is the same as a or null. So union sits on top of that uh, hierarchy, but at the moment, this uh, technology we developed for Aerometa doesn't require that that happens. We use inline classes uh, instead. So they don't replace either either because uh, uh, either is a, a right bias data type. That means it's mean for you to use things like flat map and the kind of uh, <clears throat> the kind of functions that allow you to compute monadically over structures 
and either per se being biased uh, is capable of doing so, but a union is not biased. Uh, you can make it biased if you have some extension functions, but it will be up to you to decide what the bias side is. Is it the first, the second, the third, or the 22nd argument, since there is up to union 20? There's another question. What is the relation of refined types to dependent types? Is It is the same thing. There is a direct relationship between uh, refined types to dependent types in languages such as Haskell uh, and uh, Scala, which use the type system and path dependence to model type refinements and to accumulate uh, basically type information in type signatures. And that's a way of refining types for sure that is successful and many people use in those languages. In the case of Kotlin, that doesn't make uh, much sense because Kotlin lacks uh, path dependent types. So in our case, what we do is we refine expressions that we can evaluate as constants at compile uh, time. And also we introduce a specific data flow analysis that perform logical analysis over the data flow and allows for a, a system of kind of liquid Haskell style at the expression level, not just as the at the type level. So it's a different approach, but they both serve uh, the same purpose. And this could have been accomplished with path dependent types if Kotlin had it. I hope that answers uh, the questions. <clears throat> so now that we've seen this refined type example, let's uh, uh, take a, a quick look into how, what does it mean when we are refining a type? So see, if we're refining a type like this one and, and our expression says it has to be bigger or equal than zero, we can observe that the input here, if valid, it will be uh, going through just fine. And then the data flow analysis will know from here on that this value is an integer that is bigger or equal uh, to zero, therefore making it safe for other expressions that act on positive uh, integers uh, to be safe without actually having to wrap or check further in the path. So how does it look like? Uh, let's take a quick look. In this example, this is a different domain and model. We are modeling calls to a remote API where we have some things. We have a key and the key has some constraints. It has to be of uh, size 56 and it has to be alphanumeric. So we can see here that we can use the refinement annotation over an inline class, and then we can specify each one of the predicates using the standard library. And that's the biggest difference with the type level approach that it was asked before. Here we're using the standard library APIs to actually refine our types. And we are able to evaluate these expressions as long as they're pure uh, within the compiler context in the compiler cycle. So we can capture whenever you're calling a constructor or something that is unsafe, as we will see in a little bit. Here's another example. Uh, this API, because we are using the free key, we cannot do more than a couple of requests in parallel. So here we're yet adding another predicate. <clears throat> and in this predicate, we are constraining that the only range of value has to be one or two which is what we can use uh, in the free API. So we are using the enhanced type max request, which is an inline class and has potentially minimal cost. For most cases, one box. For some others, it will have to, but uh, it still gives us a super lean uh, runtime, which is verified and checked at compile time. And finally, here's another example uh, showing the powerful uh, things of this API. Here, we're not just using the standard library, but a full-blown uh, mastodontic regular expression that we have deemed appropriate as what a URL means to us, because we didn't want to use the Java net URL constructor since it's uh, side effecting and blows up on, on invalid URLs. So we are instead at compile time verifying construction of these URLs of the configuration. They're always correct and nobody is actually uh, passing in the, in the wrong way. So <clears throat> when a refined type uh, fails to, to run, uh, 
there can be many reasons why this happened. One of the reasons might be because the value is uh, out of range, and sometimes we just may not be able to check that the value is out of range at compile time because instead of being a constant value, it might be referring to a dynamic value that comes from a database, an endpoints, or who knows, right? So in this case, refine types give you also a runtime uh, API, and this runtime API uh, ensures that whenever you take a runtime value, you always get back a nullable type, uh, so you get null if invalid or the value if valid, and you also have access to all the predicates in the map to perform manual validation uh, yourself and store any of the predicates uh, or show them whatever, however you want. There seems to be another question. Um, are there any limitations to what kind of refinements can be done? From what I understand, you basically need to validate, analyze the restrictions at compile time. Now, <clears throat> there is two, two approaches. It's a hybrid approach. There is the compile time constant evaluator approach, which is the one that works over constants. And there is another one, which is a parallel profit process for data flow analysis over the Kotlin code, which is able to logically determine uh, the data flow that you carry based on expression refinements that may come from uh, remote values or from uh, rules such as, is it okay to access the head of a list? Well, yes, if you check for it's empty. So this kind of information we carry through and we can apply into our refinements. So we can, whenever you've checked for a refined expression, then we can essentially do what Colin does with nullable types and with Booleans. We can smart cast the value. So that value is known from their own uh, to have such, such properties of the refinement. So here's an example where we have uh, all of these different refinements we were using earlier. And we see the razor key, it's bigger than it should have been. Uh, and the razor key now, if we fix it, then it compiles fine. We see another problem with the max request, we are exceeding the limit, so we can change it to two. And saying here, one of the analysis URL was malformed, then we should probably uh, fix that and then it, it all compile uh, just fine. So this uh, essentially proves that you can constrain the construction uh, of objects based on type refinements that help you model types in a much more advanced and better way than using int a string to the model IDs and and things that are probably in a much constrained range than the, the types that most of us uh, use from the standard library. There is another question. Can constructor of these inline classes be made private so validation always happen? <clears throat> yes, those constructors can be made private. So currently, you can actually do that because uh, just for public knowledge, uh, you can suppress any warning in Kotlin. So if you get an error for having a private constructor in the class, you can suppress that warning and test if in use case it's gonna work or not. There might be use cases where that might blow up if someone is checking the visibility of that for any purpose. But in whatever case, those can be made uh, private. Also type refinements are not bound to inline classes. This means you can refine regular classes as well. So for those cases where Perhaps an inline class is not really a good choice. For example, if you're using generics, it's not going to give you much of a, an abstraction because it's going to be boxing most of the time anyway. So in those cases, you can just use regular uh, classes. OK, so this covers uh, type refinements. And the next thing we're going to be talking about is about uh, given, implicit, and how we have implemented those in Kotlin and how these differ from the ones uh, in Scala. So we've implemented a, a version of uh, given implicit resolution, which this implies is that you can have a function and this function may have an arbitrary number of uh, implicit declared arguments. In this case, the argument A is implicitly declared and the compiler, instead of asking the user to provide it, we'll try to find a coherent value in the global scope that satisfies the function. 
This means that you can uh, essentially call the function just providing the argument B, and the compiler can automatically find A for you and will allow you to write more succinct uh, DSLs and less uh, boilerplate. So as always, when we provide a mechanism for the compiler to figure out something, uh, we also provide a way for users to manually overwrite it if they wish to. And in this case, uh, for any of these uh, given implicits that the compiler finds, you can always, as a user, pass an explicit argument, in which case the compiler will accept your explicit argument and not perform any resolution finding uh, the coherent value in the environment. What this implies uh, as a feature is that this is effectively uh, uh, dependency injection. And it's dependency injection that supports as a provider styles, uh, classes, values, uh, objects, top level, functions, uh, and so on. And not only supports all of those uh, declarations of Kotlin as providers for the value of your coherent type, but it also does not require constructor or setter or any kind of injection at the declaration level. It works at the expression level, which means that you can implicitly summon any of these coherent uh, values, wherever you want. Additionally, if uh, you are <coughs> familiar with uh, perhaps other languages or frameworks, you'll notice uh, this word coherence. So what this basically means is that if someone is the owner of the type A or B or any type, we want those people to be the ones uh, publishing the information for those types in the in the ecosystem because they might be the one that are adding the extensions and those will have prevalence over the ones uh, that you have locally but as a user you can always provide an implicit internal override this allows you in testing to change the behavior of remote libraries that provide uh, providers and still not being able to export it so that they don't become ambiguous when other people mix your libraries in the ecosystem. So all of these internal overrides that you provide for third party libraries, you can use in your local modules, but you won't be able uh, to export yourself uh, for others to consume. For all the data types you create, then you will be able to export for others to consume and those will be the ones chosen for the compiler when we resolve the values. And here's a couple of examples of that. We have uh, an object, the, the racer config, and this object is uh, uh, has the given annotation. The given annotation is basically flagging this function as a provider for the type racer config, and it's gonna give us a value that we want in an application based on two other uh, values. And as you've noticed here, those two other values are also flagged as given with the given function, as I mentioned earlier, in any position expression, whether it's value arguments or inside method bodies, you can summon these types uh, coherently. And here, what we are seeing is that the entire racer config will actually become materialized automatically if we also provide given key and given max parallel requests as types. And then we can also see that not only just uh, those simple configuration files, but other more complex files, like in this case, it's a full blown implementation service. We are here stating that this class provider is the provider for the NLP service. So anytime anyone wants the NLP service, as we're gonna see in a second, they can just summon this value and the compiler will find <clears throat> the racer NLP service and inject it automatically in your program. We can see here one of the final features, and these are coercion functions. Coercion functions are extremely powerful because what they do is like they shorten the path between two types, but make it invisible. In this case, we are here uh, hiding the entire complexity of our application and implementation and services in a simple API that users can consume. This says, if I have a list of analysis URLs, I have a direct coercion to an NLP remote error or set of entities, which is what this API returns. And we can do it by 
injecting the NLP service and then just fetching the entities. This results in users, uh, as you see in the bottom, we have now the key and the max parallel requests as providers for our program. And then we have entities still called explicitly. We see that it returns a union, but we can see also that when we make entities implicit, which is one of the recommendations, then the API coerces automatically hiding the entire complexity of the program. So these are the same as extension functions as we saw earlier where we project members, but in, in this case, we also uh, project subtypes. So to finalize, I'm going to show you a small, very quick table that shows uh, the theory behind some of these concepts and what we how we were be able to, to build this uh, in Kotlin. So as we saw earlier, there is a direct relationship between logic, type theory, category theory, and something like a, the Kotlin type system or a language like Kotlin. And we can see here that these relationships allows us to uh, find what Kotlin or these languages have associated on each case. And in this case, we see here that implication is associated to Kotlin in terms of extension, meaning a type extends another. But we also see in the query hover correspondence that this implication can be represented as a function from this type to the other type. And this is what all these proofs you're seeing with given coercion, refinement, and all those do. They defi define a bridge function between a type to another. So you can safely at compile time make that gap. And it's able to validate and cooperate with the Kotlin type checker so that your programs in Kotlin are 100% compatible without any changes, but you can still use these advanced features and the code you generate is also compatible downstream without your users having to use uh, the features. And <clears throat> that's uh, all I have uh, for today. Uh, I think I have one more question. Uh, let me see, Ivan is asking, only the owner can publish an implementation. A user cannot. Does this only apply to implicit usage? Can I explicitly use another user uh, implementation? Yes, you can. So essentially, you can always overcome any limitation by declaring your own internal override that points to a different or a specific implementation. For example, in the event that someone will trick the system and will compile two binaries with colliding or ambiguous uh, instances that will collide because, for example, uh, two different libraries bring the syntax for a string that uh, combine or monoid in this case provided. In that case, the user is advised that there is such collision, but that's, that collision can be easily disambiguated by you just defining a new function that is internal and in its implementation delegating to the one uh, that you want to take precedence because internal overrides always take precedence over coherent uh, global uh, instances. I hope that answers the question, Iman. Cool. I don't know if there is uh, any other questions. Uh, have no questions, I had to compliment. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All the animations and the grand help understanding the concepts. Okay, so yes, uh, I wanna say thank you, first of all, to everyone that made this presentation uh, possible. This is a, a, a joint effort of the 47 Degrees Academy and the entire market, marketing team and all the coworkers at 47 Degrees that are helping us catalog and put together uh, the best learning materials for functional programming and to get some of these more uh, abstract concepts uh, across uh, easily. So that is all. Thank you uh, to them and, and not to me and this, uh, the delivery of this message. And also I want to say that the work that you've seen on the type system, while I have been working um, the major of my time on it, it's also been the work of many others in the Aero Meta uh, team. Uh, too many to mention, but it's not just uh, uh, my work. So Thank you so much for the compliment. 
Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, the Munich uh, Cloud User Group and Microsphere for hosting me for for this talk, and hope you guys uh, enjoyed it. Uh, if you are interested in continuing the conversation, we're available in the Academy Slack and also uh, in the First Degrees Academy Slack and also in the Kotlin uh, Slack. Just ping me in the arrow uh, channels or in private, and I'll be happy to clarify any of these concepts. Or if you're interested in contributing, we also are an open community uh, and a diverse group, so we look forward to having you. Thank you. That's uh, Raul for um, contributing to uh, to the community, and I hope uh, you enjoyed it as well. And uh, yeah, um, as you said, I think people can reach um, easily to you via Twitter or Slack, or just trying to find you on the internet, right? Yes, thank you. Of course. Great, and thank you. And uh, we'll go now with the second uh, edition of uh, the second talk of this um, session of today. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, this will be my session on uh, Kator as uh, Express uh, backend development. Let me uh, double check on the YouTube video that everything is good. Yeah, everything looks good. Great. So uh, yeah, I'm, I've been playing recently with uh, Kator, and uh, uh, I just thought it would be interesting to give a talk about it um, and how to develop Express backends with Kator. For me, the main motivation was uh, there is a few platforms that allow you to create your own uh, API or to create some sort of mocking for small services. And um, um, there is also, I think, a few solutions such as Node.js that allow, allow you to uh, uh, deploy things uh, uh, very fastly and easily. So Node.js is essentially one line. You start creating your own service. Um, and on the other hand, I've been working for a few years with things such as uh, Java with Hibernate, uh, Spring, et cetera. And uh, it's something that is very powerful, but is very hard to set up initially. And I think Gator is sort of uh, bringing a little bit the gap. It's not uh, uh, it's easy as Node.js, but not as terrible as JavaScript and is uh, as powerful as uh, um, a standard um, corporate uh, Java application with all these Hibernate frameworks and stuff. It basically uses uh, DSL web services uh, to create, uh, or you can create DSL web services using Kotlin, and it's very easy to, to use, deploy, and get started with this. Um, this is the concept. We have an application, and uh, we'll have our engine to run the application. It can be Yeti or um, any other HTTP engine. And then we will be adding features. Those features can be things such as uh, authentication, using free markers, uh, et cetera, that uh, are already provided by uh, JetBrains. And we can just um, uh, include them within our application and start using it. So. Uh, yeah, so uh, those are a few of the ones we have. We can root, we can serialize, uh, we can use authentication, etc. So now uh, back to the code, and uh, let's see how this works. This is an, uh, a standard app uh, done with uh, uh, or an application that has been created with uh, Kator. Uh, if we want to create a new one, we would need to go to File, New, Project. will have Kator. We can select some of uh, uh, the features that we have spoken before uh, about, such as uh, using um, sessions, catching, uh, HTTP redirect. Uh, we can specify the authentication we, we want and then use some of those uh, templates that um, are actually very useful to uh, uh, create uh, easily uh, HTML pages. Then we will click on next. Uh, I'm actually not going to do that because then I would need to resynchronize Gradle, and that's going to take a while. So I'll um, get started uh, directly with this project that I have created. This is uh, very basic. Just have uh, installs the free marker and the authentication, and includes the, the routine as well. So for example, we could have something like a, um, uh, if we want to get the start, um, um, well, we have this method where we initialize the uh, um, our engine. So if we want to get the started you know, within the um, get blo uh, the routine block, we will start calling our uh, get function. So we could have something, um, for instance, such as uh, this hello function over here. And then we will have this call object that uh, can the, 
uh, have a few methods. Uh, for, so in this case, um, here we want to create an endpoint called hello that is going to respond something like, uh, uh, could you increase the font, please? Yeah. It's uh, better now, I think. A little bit better, right? Uh, yeah, we'll have this call object, uh, and then we will uh, be calling functions such as uh, respond text, for example, where we can uh, um, just uh, specify what we want to respond. So in this case, we will have a, this will be our very basic hello world. Here, we need to uh, call, uh, specify the, uh, the format we want. So in this case, uh, this is going to be Text. Uh, sorry, I have to specify that. This is going to be a content type. Uh, the text. Uh, and then now you see I took the wrong one. Content type this one from here. That's right. Text flame. I think I have imported previously the wrong one, and that's why it's uh, that's a problem all the time with live coding, right? That uh, I think it would be now would be good. So. By using this, we are essentially creating an um, endpoint, and we will have this call object that's just respond text. Uh, it can, um, if we try to explore what this uh, object uh, can, can do, can do a, a lot of things. So uh, essentially, can send the HTML uh, back directly. We can also specify different uh, types of uh, content type here. So this could be the plain text that uh, we could have as well, uh, uh, for example, content type. Uh, application uh, JSON and uh, that would add, uh, format automatically the um, the uh, content when it's being delivered back. So if we execute this and uh, well, I compiled before, so it should not take uh, that much until it's ready. Is listening already on this uh, URL from here. So if I came to, uh, for example, uh, Postman and type this here, and then the hello endpoint, this will be the hello world text that we have specified before. So everything good so far. A uh, few of the other things we can do. We've, uh, I've spoke before about these uh, um, uh, DSLs that we can use. So uh, we can do something very interesting, and it's also uh, uh, using uh, DSLs to get it HTML. So in this case, let's gonna have this uh, endpoint. Uh, it will just have a different URL, and we are gonna call this uh, respond HTML function instead of the respond text. And within the, this block, we will be able to use. Uh, uh, create HTML directly with a, um, uh, with a DSL. So for example, we'll have something like a body within the body and uh, each H1. Uh, this one from here. Uh, so here we can just paint this HTML, then we can have uh, something like a, a list of uh, items, then within it we can have something like from and from one to 10, we could uh, start painting. Uh, let's see if I can make the template here correctly uh, the first time. Uh, Uh, 
uh, by using this DSL from here, um, we'll just uh, we'll be creating this programmatically. I think this is very convenient because we can uh, well obviously uh, generate much easier any sort of HTML content, and we already have uh, access to all the um, the um, HTML tags that uh, that we uh, might need. So if this compiles. I think it would have been a perfect time to restart my computer before this session because uh, the RAM seems to be a bit seems to be a bit slow now. But I hope we'll survive. Uh, great. So if we call this HTML DSL right now, we see that we're painting this uh, uh, this content uh, that we have been referring here. There is also something very interesting, and is uh, we can use uh, um, free markers uh, in. Um, uh, from HTML, I think there was a question. Does this HTML DSL have a function for generating uh, generic elements like for web components? Um, I don't think this particular um, DSL, this one I think is just the basic tags from uh, uh, the basic HTML tags. Uh, so I would not say uh, anything like directly web components. I'm not sure if there is any library around that can do the same or that can does that. Um, well, um, something that we can do uh, is also use uh, uh, templates. So if we see this uh, template from here, um, it's a, well an index file that will serve us as a sort of a template and um, uh, we'll uh, uh, paint some uh, content that we define on a predefined way on the on the screen. And for example, we could have something like um, create a function, HTML free marker, uh, great. And uh, what we're going to need is to create also this index data uh, elements, uh, a data class that is going to be um, displayed. So we could do something like uh, a list of that's good enough, and uh, then. This uh, will need to. Um, we will be using the color uh, object here and uh, use the function the response that will will receive a free marker content uh, uh, constructor as the first parameter. We need to specify the um, the template and then the content. Okay. Uh, and the um, second parameter is uh, the data that we want to present. So in this case, we want to make a map of uh, data to a uh, index data of, for instance, a list of uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's parameter called etag that uh, put the right order of uh, parentheses, great. And then is the data class that I have created now here. Okay, so what do I miss? One more parenthesis. Okay. So essentially, this will take the data that I'm passing and uh, send it to the this uh, index file from here, and uh, we'll just present it on uh, as specified by this template. So, for example, if I recompile the app. There. This uh, it's in the frame up. We compile, you don't have the SLS over there. Okay. So now we have this uh, HTML free marker function. If we call it, 
so far everything is working at the uh, without any further problems we see that we just take this data and we uh, display it as it has been uh, specified on the on the template so something more than we can do uh, would be uh, uh, for example we have this authentication basic authentication right this is very neat because uh, we uh, very often need to obviously um, um, offer some sort of authentication for our uh, API and uh, we can achieve this very easily just by installing the authentication uh, feature from Kater and then just uh, for example we could have another endpoint called uh, hello out and this will be restarting okay uh, we will have this within an uh, authenticate uh, uh, block it's super slow now. when we have this we'll need to specify an authentication in order to access this endpoint otherwise it will not be accessible for us so if we recompile this here right now we see that if we try to access this endpoint so right here hello out on our postman we're actually getting a 401 unauthorized uh, that's very nice because they're um, handling also these uh, status codes back so you don't need to take care about anything what if we add this uh, user and password on our basic house I'm adding the basic out for this particular call. And now if I click on send, now we see that it has been uh, automatically authenticated. So this is something that uh, if we're using other frameworks, it's uh, I, I know that in the case of Java, Hibernate, and it's uh, a bit harder to get something that uh, that easily. And here, it's, uh, um, it's I think it's very easy to set up and allows us a lot of uh, work that um, can probably be better spent in uh, uh, other parts. Um, so now, um, one thing that we obviously need to do all the time is deal with databases and uh, um, access them and write. Uh, this is also very easy to do directly. Um, so I'm going to copy this function from here that I had before. And um, here, essentially, I'm, uh, I'm using the exposed framework from uh, JetBrains uh, in order to connect to my local machine and uh, um, be able to make queries and uh, uh, and access and paint content from the database, right? I think that's something that um, it's always, uh, we need to have it right there soon on any app that uh, starts growing. So we could have, for example, something like a, an endpoint called uh, get users that uh, we'll come back to this later that is essentially going to um, um, return us um, users from a database i have this local database here uh, and that's okay, my test database where i have these uh, uh, these three users that i have just uh, created uh, there is an id name email whatever we need and we would like to um, read them and return them back um, to our uh, through an, an, an exposed API. So in order, what we're going to have first is uh, uh, create uh, uh, the object users. We'll do something like uh, um, a user, an object here. We need to specify the, the table where the user is uh, located. And uh, then we'll have, uh, we have to define the names the field so we'll have the okay then id it's going to be an integer the name and the uh, email this will be a bar char this will be another bar char uh, of uh, then okay, I need to import the uh, I think uh, yeah everything should be good and let's gonna create for example a function called uh, get the top user data 
that uh, is going to return me a, a string. Um, for instance, we'll have this uh, JSON string at the beginning where we're going to keep uh, uh, adding all the content. And then within a transaction block, uh, we'll start querying the database to uh, see uh, how many users we have on the on the database. So see that here directly, if I'm calling the, uh, let's see if I can import this. If I'm calling this user uh, that I have just created, I can uh, directly operate and perform all these queries automatically. So we can do something like uh, um, sell all the, get all the users, sort them by user ID. We can specify the order, standing or descending. And for example, we can limit them to five. Since we have said uh, uh, top users, we only want to get five, even if we only have three of the database. Then we're going to uh, insert them in a response uh, object. There's going to be an array list of uh, users. Uh, that's right. And then for each uh, user that is in the my list of users, I'll just add it to the response user using the um this construct from here so here i need to specify the user id here the name last but not least the uh, email so the everything so the Um, not really. That's uh, these users from here. It's the uh, data class that I'm going to use for uh, deliver the transfer the the user information. So if I came here and up, so another question. It is hard to grind your own feature. Uh, I haven't honestly tried to do that. Uh, I'm not really sure how um, easy it would be or not. I'm sure. Um, Right, sure. Um, feature data. I'm sure there should be um, uh, yeah, some uh, documentation of custom features from uh, from um, JetBrains, but I personally never done that before. Um, so coming back to this data class, uh, this is essentially just uh, reflects the um, the data that is on the database. So it would be could be some sort of uh, DTO. Uh, if I want to call it like that. And then we'll have the everything here. So, okay. Compiles, good so far. Okay, so what we are going to have now, it's uh, uh, create uh, directly with uh, using the JSON uh, class. Uh, work here and then we will just be returning this JSON object right here. Okay. Um, good. Seems to be compiling. Okay. Good. So now that we have done that, uh, my idea with this is also that I'm obviously coding and explaining, and I, I, it's uh, um, rather slow, but uh, I just wanted to show how easily we can just start getting started with uh, um, having a backend that is functional in less than 30 minutes and is connecting and making insertions and operations in a database. So here we'll have something like, um, uh, we'll be calling the function response text. We can call the function we have created before, get the user data and specify that uh, in this case, we want the content type to be uh, uh, JSON. Sending JSON, so I don't see this yet compiling, but I think this will get fixed now, okay. Function. Happy. So uh, let's see if we compile this. What happens? Will uh, unless there is any mistake, uh, it will just paint the um, 
the content of this database. Uh, not server errors. I made something wrong, probably. Uh, okay, I'll have to probably we have to change here one type. This is an integer here. Taking, uh, well, I'm not going to start debugging now, but uh, so there's some sort of problem here with the types here. I can define this as a integer as well. Okay, well, um, I actually had uh, this, uh, I did this example before. So if I run this and uh, I think uh, I have this one here on my side. Uh, Right, so a copy of uh, whatever I'm doing, so I know it's uh, going to work in case there is any problem with the internet or, okay. So what if I call this now? Somewhere on my live code, there was a problem, but uh, here um, you see that I'm essentially going to the, uh, taking all the content from the database. So if I add a new uh, element, so we can just change this sample at sample.com. Uh, remake the call, we see that uh, uh, the new item appears here. Well, so that was everything. I, uh, uh, my idea or my target was to make, uh, be able to make a backend in, uh, can you please show the response headers? Yeah. Let me come here to the, uh, Uh, yeah, I, you see that here I have, a, for example, a grid in this application JSON. That's what is being the, uh, delivered back. If uh, we came back to, uh, I think another of the, was Hello, for example, was using plain. Uh, so if we call the Hello with no authentication here, it should return just a plain text. So that can, can also be controlled on the, with the call, on the call object. Uh, as I mentioned, my idea was to prove that it's possible to have something running and functional in less than 30 minutes. Um, I have been actually developing and backing myself for a side project, and I think Kator um, serves very well the purposes of um, side projects. And I personally like them much better than solutions with Node.js or that, well, I, I'm, I'm not a particular fan of uh, um, uh, developing backing with JavaScript, but that uh, I, I think it serves the purpose very well of site projects. It can actually be deployed to a Google Cloud. And um, there is uh, a Heroku. Uh, you can obviously create your own, uh, run, uh, run it locally and uh, expose it and uh, uh, to the public. But uh, here it's very easy to, to actually deploy it. I deployed mine in the App Engine and it's, uh, it's also relatively out of the box. Um, so, well, that was everything. Uh, if you have any questions uh, and I know the answer, I would love to uh, uh, answer them. Otherwise, you can always find me on uh, Twitter, ping me there. And I think without further delay, I'll uh, give the word now to uh, our next fabulous speaker, Nick. Yeah. Everything yours. Oh, I'm totally unprepared. Right here. Good.
G'day, Kotlin Meetup. How are you all today? Um, let's uh, start with some Kotlin flow. Um, I'm also going to be bouncing in and out of uh, yeah, um, Keynote and Code. Um, it's also primarily targeted for um, uh, Android guys. So um, yeah, um, there's obviously uh, heaps of code about flow in there as well, but some of this, the code I'll be brushing over is very Android-y, so sorry for that. Um, but you can also fo follow along here. This is the, the GitHub, which has all the code that I'm going to show you, um, which might help you follow along if I sort of go too fast or you want to dig into something and ask as we cruise along. Um, maybe I'll just not do the presentation mode there because then I can't see anything. Um, but okay, cool. So flow. Uh, I've got my little notes here, and you can see them. That's cool. So why flow and why Star Wars? So first of all, this heading is a little bit um, misleading. Kotlin flow and New Hope. I was trying to combine like Star Wars and Kotlin flow, um, but yeah, Kotlin flow isn't isn't like the be all and end all because Rx Java is crap or something like that. It's just like uh, a way of trying to combine it with uh, Star Wars. Why I combine it with Star Wars? So um, uh, a while ago, I created a, um, sorry, I'll get to that in a minute, why flow? OK, so let's go down here to this little quote here. Um, I wasn't really interested in flow much at all until I started reading this uh, article here, this particular article. Um, it, Flow was kind of like a, bl a black hole for me. I was starting to learn Rx Java and get really into Rx Java, and then I read this this article and I was like, oh, okay, maybe it is worth uh, checking this out. Um, so the the main reasons that I started to look into it and the sort of summary of this of this um, this article is that Flow is kind of the intention behind Flow is to build on the shoulder shoulders of giants. So have a look at Rx Java. Um, it's been around for a long time. It's matured, so it's it's super mature. But it's also like, you know, gotten a bit stuck, similar to how Java got a bit stuck. And yeah, their idea is to sort of learn from all those mistakes, have a look at how people are using Rx Java, and try to make something that's just gonna can gonna like satisfy like the eighty twenty principle. You know, like. What's a comment from Johannes? Uh, uh, do you uh, are you supposed to be, or do you want to share your screen, or uh, ah, yeah. we are seeing your face now? Okay, yeah, share screen. That would be better. Right. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. Better. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So <laughs> let's go back. Take a screenshot of this, or maybe I'll just post this in the chat. Oh, oh, fuck. Um, so that you can download that and follow along if you feel like it. Um, yeah, and I won't post that one because I want you to listen to me and not read this. You can read that media article later on. Uh, I'll post all these these links uh, later on. Um, so. Uh, yeah, so yeah, there were slides, sorry. Um, yeah, to me, I like the, the at least the, the sort of takeaway of this article is that Flow is is designed to be the, the, the Kotlin to Java, right? So, you know, Kotlin came along and sort of rocked the Android world. It really took over very quickly. Um, and Flow is kind of, they're trying to do the same thing with that, right? Uh, and it's not completely open source, so it's not run by like a community. It's it's sorry, it is open source, but it's still curated by the JetBrains guys, and they're really strict about what they want in there and what's not allowed in there. And they, if you try to ask for a feature, and you can, it's all online, you can go and check it out on GitHub. They're really like, why do you want this? Why? Show me why? 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 Uh, and it, it's really cool. It sort of pushes people to to really think hard about what they're doing and. Don't know, that convinced me enough to, to sort of look into it. So um, 
how? So I started to play around with Flow um, by taking an old uh, take-home assignment that I designed a, a few years ago. It was based around Star Wars. Um, it looks like this, very simple. So just like a, a, a list of uh, characters and then a detailed screen on the other side, right? Um, really uh, a fairly straightforward app, but real world nonetheless. The idea was to, to give people something that was like a pretty good reflection of, of our app without actually giving them the, the source code, right? And then creating issues or feature requests or whatever on top of that and making it something that's actually a little bit of fun. Um, and yeah, this is what it was. So it looked like this when you got it, you could build it and run it. And it ran against the Star Wars API, which is a free like free online API, which is pretty easy and, and nice to, to sort of use. It's not super complicated, not super detailed, just fairly simple and nice, you know. Uh, this is what it looks like. So you can also go and check that out. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing too crazy in there. So the first task that, that um, gave people was to um, extend uh, what was already there, right? And like this is this is kind of like a um, you know I've written there how well can you copy and paste and and it's kind of like half joking. Uh, actually, copy and pasting is a bit of a skill that you learn when you're a junior. So you can read my presenter notes down here, which is a little bit embarrassing. But yeah, um, you know, ha having that ability to, to come in and, and look at someone's code style and build on top of it is, is a skill, right? And so it's good to be able to, yeah, add, create, add a feature to a, to a, to a code, um, to a set of code, to a certain code style and um, do it without breaking anything, right? So in this case, we just want them to add a BMI, body mass index, uh, which is just more or less weight divided by height, um, and push that onto the screen, right? Nothing too insane. So just something that looked like that would now look like that. Yeah, and easy enough to do that just by taking the mass and the height out of the, the information that's coming back adding that to the, the data transfer object and off we go. So let's have a look at the code. Um, <clears throat> this is the part where I might fly through it a little bit fast, faster than you may enjoy, but time is against me. So let's start down the bottom near the metal. Um, first of all, uh, before you get into flow, it's a great idea to sort of get into coroutines first, right? Um, understanding how suspension functions work and just sort of getting used to that code style, it, it can be a bit of a bit of a um, bit of a jump, right? Because because us in in the Android world, we're we're used to closures and callbacks, and even with Rx Java, you have like um, you know closures where you where you sort of go into this like pyramid of doom stuff. Um, and coroutines gets around all that, uh, but still it's a bit of a sort of like a uh, bit of mental gymnastics to, to, to understand how that, that all works. Still, um, our favorite retrofit um, uh, call adapters works super easily with it. So we just have to add suspend to our um, interface and boom, uh, going and getting everything is, is super, super simple, right? Um, moving up a level, we have our Star Wars service, which gives us something that looks a little bit more interesting. Uh, we have get people, which gives us a flow of results to um, that API. So this, this is obviously calling get people, which is giving us a people response. Um, and what does that look like when we go down? Uh, here's where we start doing some interesting stuff and starting to see some cool flow things. Um, sorry, if you're asking questions and I can't see them. Maybe Enrique, you can just buzz me if someone asks a question and it's urgent. Uh, I'd like right. to know if uh, they ask anything. Choice. 
just send me a message on um, on uh, Telegram, man. Yeah. <laughs> Um, right, so you can see over here that, that um, get people is not a suspension function, right? That's because we're getting a flow back. And to start with at least, and I'm, like, I'm not a flow expert, right? So you're probably gonna ask some like crazy rocket science questions over here on my right, but I'm not a flow expert. I've really just like been playing with this. So if you see stuff that I've done that's crazy and stupid here, feel free to like make a pull request or, or ping me, it'd be awesome, right? I've really only been playing with this for a little bit of time, so maybe the last like month or two. So um, feel free. Uh, yeah, but a flow like it's similar to learning another language. It's it's good to to sort of you know make a one to one comparison as to what you know use use your old vocabulary to transpose it on the on the new one. So so uh, you know if you've been doing lots of RX stuff, flow is is more or less the same as a observable. Right, it's easy, easy to think about it like a, as an observable. Um, then flow is a builder for your observable, right? So this would be like observable.create, right? And this is where the cool stuff about flow comes in, right? Because uh, flow is essentially trying to harness the cool things about coroutines and Kotlin and make them into a, a, a nicer, you know, a solution to the the reactive uh, problem, right? So this is your builder, and we have then emit, which is uh, you can think of as uh, next. So our next in uh, the Rx Java world, and for and then down here we have flow on, which is yeah your your um, thread manipulation stuff that you would see in in, in Rx Java too. Um, the cool thing about this though is that it's not as confusing as Rx Java, And there's lots of stuff online about, about um, uh, context preservation. Um, but what that means is just that um, this is gonna run in the IO thread, I think, more or less, right? So everything in here will run on the IO. And it doesn't matter what happens uh, underneath here. So, you know, over here, we call um, some other uh, coroutines doesn't matter if they run on IO or they run on the main thread, whatever. Um, this is just telling us that this will run on the on the IO thread. And that's kind of um, that's kind of what's cool about flow that's different from RX. Um, right, so what are we doing here? Uh, probably looks a bit um, ugly, but um, essentially we're doing paging. So when we get people, uh, the, the API gives us pages uh, and we just cycling through all those pages and emitting them one at a time. So we have two emits. This just um, gives us an empty list. I'm not sure why I did that, probably just a prime for some reason. <clears throat> and then every um, successful response that we get, we just throw it back onto the flow. Um, get person is a little bit simpler. Uh, and this is more like a single, even though it's still just a flow, we're just emitting once. So yeah, you can think of that just more like a single. Um, moving up to the view model, I'll skip the actual implementation of the view model for the second, for the moment. So we're, we're jumping over the, the interesting part just for a moment uh, to have a look at the view model interface. So this is, this is our view model. All of these things are, are what we're eventually going to put up on the screen. So these are the ones that we're interested to start with. You can see that they're all flows, all observables. Often people would be using uh, live data here, but um, I don't want to mix live data and flow and Rx Java. Even though you can, they're all supposed to interoperate through uh, the publisher interface. Um, but I'm trying to put less libraries into my code, not more. So. Uh, yeah, and then in, up in the fragments, uh, we keep them nice and thin. So there's not really much happening up here, just some bindings, right? So we're just binding um, the, binding our, yeah, view models to our uh, view, right? There's a little bit of fancy plumbing going on, but this is essentially just plumbing, right? Uh, maybe the plumbing is interesting for you, so let's show you that. Uh, 
So bind detect view is just a wrapper around bind. But essentially here we're just uh, taking a property, uh, a flow, and then sending it, launching a coroutine and sending that onto this um, block down here, collecting it and sending it onto the block. Right. Um, launching coroutines is a little bit uh, funky, uh, especially in Android. You have to be careful to, to add something like this because um, exceptions that happen in, in coroutines are actually swallowed by whatever happens <laughs> underneath the hood. Uh, and yeah, you, you don't actually see anything in Logcat and you won't, you, you just, in your, your um, whatever your error, your crash, crash reporter also won't capture it. So um, yeah, make sure you have some sort of handler mixed into this, into the, um, into your launching. Uh, mom, 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 mom. Where were we? Right, implementation. So this is where the interesting stuff happens, right? So I've just quickly sort of gone glossed over the, mm. the plugin. Yeah, um, I was going to say that there is a, I'm, I don't think it's a question, it's a comment from Lyubomir. Paging is one very good case for flow. For example, the Jetpack Paging 3 library is 100% Kotlin, coroutines, and also flow. Jetpack Paging 3 library. Oh, yeah. Cool. Right on. Yeah, I didn't know about that, man. Um, I have to check it out. Um, yeah, paging is, is definitely a, a, an awesome one, right? So, yeah. Um, anything that actually emits twice is cool. But actually, I, I, I think that what I like most about it is this stuff. So all the operators and and uh, in the view models, right? So where I spend most of my, my job most of my day actually is in view models, I would say, you know, if I'm lucky, right? And so doing cool stuff in here is it's really saves me a lot of time in general. Um, so have a quick look at this while I take a swig of my beer. Ah, good Lord, Munich makes good beer. Okay. So you can see what we're doing here. We're just asking for a person. When that person comes back, we are, yeah, flowing that person into this uh, this property, which is private, and then transforming um, that person into, uh, or mapping that person into different um, into its different properties, and then sending that up to the to the fragment for binding, right? Nothing too crazy, but um, there's a couple of like talking points that you know, would take. So this, this all used to be in RX Java, like I said, and um, there's a couple of talking points around around this. Um, and I guess it's kind of weird. It feels weird doing this in my like office. I can't actually see and talk to anybody, but I would normally be asking you what what if anything you see. <laughs> wrong here and I mean there's lots of things wrong here but you know uh, feel free to just uh, throw them in, into the comments or something uh, and I'll just fuck it I'm just gonna show it to you it's easier so um, <clears throat> I've got this running uh, here oh, no, I don't. Let's run it first um, I'm gonna run it and show you uh, some things that are wrong, right? So first of all, obviously we're, we're just swallowing all the errors, right? Which is a bit, a bit boring and crap. Um, but second of all, um, each one of these flows, flows are, are, are cold, right? So it, each one of these these gets started as a coroutine, right? So when we when we're doing our binding up in the fragment up here. We're actually launching a coroutine, right, and then collecting, which means that that each one of these is a coroutine, and each one of these creates one of these, and each one of these goes away and calls our service, right? And so you can see, even though, um, okay, I've, I've created a fake um, Star Wars API over here, um, just because the Star Wars API went down. <laughs> Two days ago, luckily that happened because 
um, yeah, it made me create this like fake um, interface or fake implementation of the Star Wars API. So I'm not actually using the real one right now. This is, this is just a fake, uh, which is a little more useful actually. But anyway, when I click on, on Luke Skywalker here, um, which I'll bring it down so you can see me do it. Um, I've got like a little logging thing here that's going to show us how many calls we make to the backend. So you can see then we made everything looks okay here, right? It's just like, yeah, sweet, that works. It's no problem. But um, just like another one of Roman's uh, uh, recent articles, you know, being intentional about uh, quality and things like that, not just the functional what happens, is also important. So it's important to, to have a look at this and go, oh man, we're hitting the, the back end four times, <laughs> one for each of these, right? And you know, as we get up, uh, on and we start you know, asking for more stuff, then that gets worse and worse and worse. So yeah, that was my first task to figure out was how to do that in, um, in flow. And I don't know if you guys are, uh, are, are experts in flow. We've probably got some, some crazy geniuses here from, from, uh, from um, uh, JetBrains. So maybe you can like throw that into the chat, like what's a good way to do what you would normally do in, 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 uh, in Rx Java is something like share, you know, or, um, or replay or something like that. And there's lots of stuff online about, uh, you know, what, how, how flow is going to, going to handle this, but there are interim solutions, of course. Um, so maybe, uh, maybe one of you rocket scientists has already, um, Responded. Let me just zoom out and check. Yeah. Uh, nah, no one. Oh man, no rocket scientists today. That's a shame. Okay, I'm just gonna have to give you my um, my uh, solution. So I came up with this uh, broadcast in right new model scope, and then. You know, this old chestnut as flow and you can pretty much just like put as flow onto like anything and it just turns it into a flow, which is pretty sick. But okay. So what this does is it um, converts our flow into a good old channel and a channel is something that can be shared. And uh, that's where the limit of my knowledge uh, <laughs> ends, right? Um, all I know is that that works. How exactly it works, um, I can't go into too much detail, unfortunately. It, but it it does do something like uh, essentially stores this somewhere, stores the last value that comes from here, and then shares that to all the subscribers. All, all the yeah subscribers. Can you say that in flow? I don't know. So yeah, now when we when we do that. Um, you can see we only call the back end once. Hooray. Right. <clears throat> back to whoa. Um, back to the presentation. Task two, flat map. There's three tasks, so um, don't be afraid this doesn't go forever. Now, like I said before, heaps of um, heaps of Android devs when coroutines came out started talking about, oh my God, it's going to, a coroutine is going to totally take over Rx Java or coroutines, which should we choose? They're not the same, man. Hello. Like it's, it's really a shame because it, it just, it just highlights how, how like silly the, and, and sort of trendy the, the, the whole Android scene is, you know, and it, it, in heaps and heaps of projects that I've worked on, um, people use Rx Java, they import it and use the whole, the whole library just to create threads, you know, so just to go onto the background thread and come back on the main thread, just to like marshal threads. And that's why everyone thinks that the coroutines and Rx Java are like comparable. No. So this, 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 um, second task was kind of like to, to separate those people, right. So to figure out whether, whether people understood that or not. Right. And usually something like a flat map, you know, and I'm like, I'm, I'm not an Rx guru, right. I, I really, I don't think I don't think it's possible for anyone to be, but like, uh, flat map is kind of one of the the things that will confuse you if you've never done any RX programming before, right? Um, 
and it, it, you know, there's going to be geniuses in this in this people in this uh, meetup who are just like flat map the, you know, but there's also like beginners who are just like quietly going, I have no idea what the hell that is, right? Uh, and this this um, this task is kind of to to separate those two people. So classic flat map usage. What we need to do is add some details about the character's home planet to the screen. Yeah. So uh, each person on the on the API has a home world. Um, unfortunately, it's it's coded with a bloody URL, but I stripped that out in a very nasty way. Please forgive that code. Um, but yeah, so for every person, we need to go and get the person's details. So just like what we we're doing before. And then we need to do another one and go and get their planet of birth, right? So essentially for each screen load here, we need to make two calls to the back end. Code back again. It's good that I put those big um, big reminders in there. Okay. Uh, let's go in here and I've, here's one that I prepared earlier. Uh, right. So now we're using a different view model. Let's get let's go in and have a look at this one. Part two. And these are just basically condensed, you know, I've just like cut things out to make each subsequent step a little clearer. Right, so now uh, we've introduced this like state class, right? Uh, you can call it many things. Uh, some people might call this the view model, uh, actually. <laughs> That's essentially what we're supposed to be doing with view models. Um, it's not exactly because actually we kind of reduce this down into the view model. Um, but yeah, we can construct the view from this information here, right? So in essence, all we really need to do is populate, um, you know, create a flow of the states. And from the state, we can determine what the UI should look like, right? So obviously it starts looking like with nothing. And then we go and do a little tricky flat map, right? So we go and get the person, just like we did before. And actually, all of this code looks more or less the same as it did before. The only difference is that we're using this flat map now, which is something like the switch map in, um, in Rx. Uh, yeah, the, the guys from um, JetBrains kind of merged these all into, a, into one. You know, again, like using the whole like uh, opinionated uh, method um, is making uh, allowing them to iterate really really quickly and do things in a way that like is is like no 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 we're smart we know what we're doing yeah just deal with it don't do it stupidly do it our way right um, which is a little bit like uh, um, what do you call it uh, uh, dictatorish but it works right sometimes being a dictator in in a, in, in a product design is is very helpful. Just ask Steve Jobs. So um, what are we doing here? Flat map can, can cap. Uh, we're going away. And you can see here now we, we're, with a flat map, we're basically uh, flattening two flows, right? So we're taking this flow. And every result that we get from this flow, we will kick off this here. And convert it to another flow. So here, if we get an error, now we're actually doing something, which is actually still doing nothing. But if we get a success, then we go away and we get the planet. And getting the planet looks very, very similar. So get planet, get the planet ID from the, from the person. And if we manage to go all the way down the happy path, we get a person and a planet and we return that back onto the flow, right? And then we have our, our usual um, plumbing uh, just down here. Uh, it, it's cool because it like, you know, you can create like subflows sort of things. Like, so a person is, you know, reducing the state into a person, but we're not actually really using the person directly. These guys use the person and same thing with the planet, right? I love this kind of stuff. This is the kind of stuff that like makes your code look really nice and easy to understand. Okay, we don't know. Don't, don't try that. Don't try that. Um, okay, so what does it look like? Uh, let's have a little look. Um, yeah, maybe I 
can show you the, the log down here. So that's interesting. Nice loading screen. And voila. Right. So now we have both those bits of information popping up on the screen. Um, yeah, nothing too fancy just yet, but still there's lots of things that are missing. So I had a lot more fun in task three. Um, hopefully there's a few of you who are still awake because this is where the wizards come out. So this is stuff that like hardly anyone really got to be honest in the, in the, um, homework assignments that we did because it's pretty full on. I mean, you have to really enjoy this stuff to, to sort of get into like doing this. Um, I don't know, maybe I'm just special, but, but, um, I don't know. Reactive programming is, is very different from normal programming. And so it's kind of a challenge to, to make things, make it do really cool things. And this was one of them, right? So the, 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 ter the third task was, uh, to add, uh, something that looks like this to the screen. So a new hope, and this is where the title of the, of the talk came from. A new hope, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, right? For, for um, you know, Luke Skywalker or Darth Vader or whatever. Um, the idea is obviously that you, you have to go away. So you have to do a flat map, but we were already doing a flat map here, but now we have to go and make several calls to get this information, right? So for every film, um, that the, the character has, we have to go and make four calls. For this guy, we have to make four calls. Uh, so N calls, right? If that makes sense. So yeah, detail screen now, now we need to go and get a person and then get a planet and then get uh, all these films. And this is, this is the cool one, right? I mean, I, so going from two to three is going to be quite a big jump, but bear with me. Cause there's lots of other stuff happening here now as well. I've put in like loading and retries, error states and stuff like that. So it's getting a little bit, a little bit crazy, but hopefully um, we can follow along. Um, so I'll skip over what we did with the planets um, and go straight into the interesting stuff. Okay, let's go um, do it the normal way first. Um, <clears throat> Okay, how should I show you this? Before before we were going and just getting planets, right? Now we want to go and create a film, up a flow that just gives us a string, right? So this is this is a a, a function or a, a flow that is just going to we're, we're going to throw strings into it, right? As best we can, and the string is supposed to look like like this. So we use this, this handy little combine uh, function, which is very similar to, to Rx. Again, we've got combine in Rx. Um, <clears throat> for planets, we do more or less the same thing. The only difference is that we, we are now handling some errors in a little cool way. But in both cases, we just add whatever films, <clears throat> whatever we get from films, uh, we just throw into the state, right? Uh, and for planet, if we get a good planet, then cool, we throw it in. If we don't, then it gets skipped. We have these cool little um, on start operators, which are really similar to, to RxJava, um, except that they uh, let you emit onto um, onto the stream, which is which is really, um, I'm not sure if that, if, if Rx actually does that as well, but usually Rx, I would like, I would use these, these operators to do some sort of side effect. So not actually to touch the stream itself, but to, to, you know, to do something else outside, outside the context of this, of this flow. Um, but this doesn't, so this allows you to do things like loading, uh, in the on start operator, which is cool. Um, 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 now we go down to the film flow and, and this is where the, the, the really cool stuff happens, right? This is what, um, where all the fun happens. I'm just going to change that to concat. So we have different types of flat map, right? But not many, just like, um, three. 
right? Uh, all of them are, are interesting in their own ways, but there's there's really just three of them. There's not like 50 like in RF Java, right? So Flatmap can cat what that does, and you can you can watch this happen. It does these one by one, right? So it just goes get film, and when that's finished, it flicks it on down to here, and then does the next one, right? One after the other, serially. And we can see that if we if we run this. Let's run it, check it out. So it's worth mentioning, I, I guess, that that um, uh, over here in the fake Star Wars API, when we get get the films, I'm adding in like a random delay between two and ten seconds, right? Uh, so that sort of adds a little bit of like uh, realism, I guess, and it makes it more obvious, so you can see what's happening a little bit better. So let's have a look. Ah, shit, I didn't swap them over. Damn. Why didn't anyone remind me, man? See, this wouldn't have happened in a real life demo, right? I could just be, I could just be talking to an absolutely empty crowd. You know, there could be absolutely nobody listening right now. It's, it's really weird. Okay, now we've got loading. See, radical. Planet comes back, and now we have films. And you can see here, boom. Hopefully we get another one. Aha! Right, two and ten seconds. Right, so they start coming back one at a time. And, you know, uh, this is I have really great discussions with, with people who, who uh, love reactive streams and, and how they work and how they all fit together and everything um, with this particular task because it's a really interesting one you know how do you how do you make this better you know how do you optimize this and um, I mean I've already given away the, the answer right because um, I changed it online while you're all watching um, so yeah, we can do that with the merge, right? So if we change it to merge, what happens is it just kicks off all of these flows all at once, right? And again, just to, to show to go through this a little bit more, we have film IDs being converted to a flow. So this is literally just a list of ints, converting that to a flow, and that means it just it'll do this flatten that merge means it will give each film ID, and we'll go and call. Uh, the Star Wars service once for each film ID, uh, and here we're just converting that into a, um, a string. Again, doing not something not so great. We're converting it to a null, so we're just kind of ignoring any errors that come back. And actually, I put in some errors here on purpose, so you can see that you know Luke Skywalker is actually in. Uh, well, that's not true. I've, I've screwed that up, but. He should be in, in this <laughs> in this galaxy. He should be in six films, but one of them I'm purposely erroring on, and you can see that then it just leaves it out completely, right? Which is not ideal. But it also means that we have this loading thing, which is kind of cool, just so you know that something's happening. And then the wizard stuff, scan reduce. All right? This is a, this is such a cool operator, and I don't know, it, it, it can do some really cool things. Um, yeah, look it up. If you if you understand how the scan reduce works, you're more or less like uh, allowed into the the wizards club. But we can do better, right? So so this was like I said, we're not using we're using nulls and we're just ignoring anything that comes on that's that's um that's an error. So uh, I've got this other one here which is ready to go, which is using doing some crazy 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 stuff. Uh, so, you know, something that's bad about this, this, this here is that, you know, like you saw it just sort of, it shows you one and then, oh, whoops, another one pops up. Oh, oh yeah, another one. Is this finished yet? Or I don't even know. You know, there's no loading. There's nothing that tells you that something, something new is going to happen. So, um, one of the sort of ideas that we came up with is wouldn't it be cool to have like, 
Uh, there's lots of different ways you could do that. So maybe you just show like a loading here on the end, telling you that one more is still coming, right? Uh, that's one way of doing it. That was like another iteration of this, this film's flow. Um, but the one that I like the best, it's, it doesn't look amazing, I guess, but you know, you could, you could work with that. Um, conceptually is, is to, to show all of them at once. Uh, oh, sorry, I didn't show you merge, right? So, um, yeah, I changed that and I didn't show you what happens there. So, okay. So now we have merge here. Let's, um, let's just show you the difference really quickly. Right. Old Luke Skywalker. So now we've got the planet and now we're loading. As soon as we get one back, boom, 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 boom. They're all happening in, in parallel now. And that makes things go much faster. Right. So merge. If in doubt, try merge. Does some cool things. Okay. Sorry. So now let's go to the complicated one and I'll just show you what that looks like straight away. It's just easier to explain, you know, cause the thing is that we, we know at this point up here, we know that, that, um, oh, 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 oh. at this point here, we know how many IDs there are, right? So we should be able to do something with that straight away. And that means basically, yeah, giving, giving something for each film ID, we, we should be able to like give something to the flow down here to tell it, hey, hey, something's coming, right? So here we're gonna, on start, we're gonna emit a pair. And, and this is basically, this whole thing here is gonna be giving back a pair of film ID to status, more or less, right? So we have loading here, we have error, and then we have success. And as soon as this, this flow starts, we're gonna, um, give that pair um, to the scan operator and it's going to throw it into a uh, hash map and that map is going to be um, reduced down here into a string, right? <laughs> uh, if you haven't gone cross-eyed yet, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll just play it for you. It's, it's much easier to understand if you, if you see it. to see what I'm trying to achieve here, right? Right, so you can see now that we have loading and we have some indication that things are happening still, right? And now you know that this, the screen is complete. You know, okay, I'm not a, like a, a UI expert, right? I couldn't put in loading symbols or whatever, dot, dot, dots or something fancy, whatever. But, you know, the principle is the same, right? And now you know that you, you got an error loading film three, right? Um, that's about it. Like I said, I know that's, that's kind of um, a lot to, to go over. Um, I, you know, refresh as well. I have this, like, trigger relay, which um, uses a channel to, to sort of trigger a, a full refresh if, in case there was an error. Um, that's kind of cool. I don't know if that's the best way to do it either, right? So I, I really would love if, if you guys could check out this repo and just sort of tear it apart and, and say this is, um, there's better ways of doing this. That would be cool. <coughs> so uh, my thoughts on, um, on flow, just to summarize and sum up, the TLDR sort of um, ending. Um, you know, it, it, you know that I really can't stress stress it. I, everything I'm going to say is is kind of going to be crap compared to reading that article. Um, you know, because it tells you the intentions. So, so migration, for example, if you if you're using live data and RX Java, it should be possible to slowly introduce flow. It might be really hard, you know, and uh, <laughs> not giving any guarantees, but like in, at least in theory, it should be possible to to migrate. Uh, fairly easily, right? They all they all um, adhere to a standard, and that standard 
should allow them to interoperate. That's why you see so many cool and easy libraries that go RxJava, you know, like flowable to live data and blah, 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 and reverse, right? So interoperating it should be pretty easy. Flow is still stabilizing though. So I, I'm actually holding off on putting it into the, the um, project that I'm working on now, which, which would really benefit from it. Um, but yeah, the, it, not, not, not that it's like an in, unstable product that crashes all the time. It's more that the API, the, the interfaces and that are still, um, you know, changing. Also, there's new things coming out all the time. So something that I, I started to look into but didn't actually use in the end was um, shared flow. Um, I think there's another one was flow state, something like that. Something that's very similar to mutable um, live data and, and live data, that sort of um, idea. Um, but you know, even though it is stabilizing, I really think it's moving quickly, right? So. The, the, the discussions that are happening on GitHub are like happening really fast, you know? And so um, I, I think it's it's going to come very quickly, just like um, Kotlin did. And that's, that's kind of my prediction, right? Um, testing, I, I sort of I started doing testing uh, and I didn't get enough time to sort of finish it. So I didn't want to show you that. But there is some some tests in the, in the repo. Testing is a bit of a sticky point for a lot of people. Uh, but I've done a lot, a lot of testing already with coroutines, just pure coroutines, and I don't know what the fuss is about. Actually, I thought it was really quite quite easy. Um, and exception handling, yeah, like I told you, um, just be careful about using a handler. And, and that's more or less it. Um, here's the screen that you can take a photo of. Um, thanks a lot for having me, and um, yeah. Catch you guys at the next one, hopefully um, in person. And yeah, it's been great, man. Broadcasting like it's uh, 1980 from from my um, from my office. <laughs> Home to you in the studio. I think you're muted, Enrique. Hear me now? Yeah, gotcha, man. Yeah, just uh, wanted to say thanks, Nick, for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed the, the session as well. There was a few uh, comments here from Lubomir. Um, he actually has written a question uh, for you, testing with coroutines. Oh yeah. Uh, uh yeah. <clears throat> um, there's 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 lots of stuff around schedulers. Yeah. Um, um, for coroutines, essentially very similar to to Rx Java. Actually, you what I do is I just inject. There's heaps of stuff online about this. Um, Inject the dispatches. So yeah, you know when you when you use a dispatcher in the um, in your code, like I, I, in my code, I've just used dispatches.io. But you can use you know if you use a provider, then you essentially can inject them into your view models, and that allows you then during tests to inject a test dispatcher, which is something like trampoline. Um, yeah, all possible, you know. Um, then there's multiple um, sort of extension functions for running uh, like test coroutines. Um, you have to be a bit careful, but I think it's it's actually in in the code that I'm using now. Uh, I'm doing it the right way. I might have to check that. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there's some some dispatch some sch schedulers do funky stuff like. Uh, you know, jump over delays, for example. So, you know, like you saw in my code, I have a delay for 30 seconds or something. Obviously in your tests, you don't, you, normally you wouldn't want that to happen. So you can you can use a, 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 um, a scheduler that just ignores that and just keeps going. Um, cool stuff like that. Um, but yeah, there's lots of stuff online about how to do that. It, that's the, the problem is though, that, like I said, it's, it's stabilizing. So it's hard to, 
it's hard to know what's current information and what's not. You really have to go to the source, go to like GitHub and have a look at the issues or ping the guys from JetBrains. They're like, they're super into flow, man. Like they, they live and breathe it. I hope they're not here, man, because they probably just like saw that presentation and went, blasphemy. <laughs> you know, but uh, uh, yeah, um, it's, it's definitely possible. And it's very, uh, it's very similar to RxJava, I have to say. It's, it's not. If you've done testing with trampolines and stuff in in RxJava, then it won't be won't be super like new stuff for you. Yeah. Hope that answers your question, bro. Um, so let me know. Yeah, that's it, man. Yeah, no problems. Okay, if any of you uh, have any question, um, you can uh, write it there, or otherwise, I guess they can uh, reach out, Nick, on Twitter, or... Yeah, man, yeah, I'll put my, my little Twitter link in here. Um, pretty straightforward, but just come to the, to the... I mean, I don't know, are most of these, these dudes in, um, in Munich, you reckon, or...? Uh, I'm not really sure. We posted it on Twitter, and uh, I think we had at the peak around 70 people. Uh, I'm assuming there would be uh, some um, uh, strangers to the city observing yeah. them. There's lots of dudes from, I can see lots of names that, that come from the east, you know, and like, man, the, the people who I'm working with from the Ukraine and like uh, recently Belarus and then also in Russia, man, they have some crazy rocket scientists over there, man, I'm telling you. I reckon they're, they're here, checking it out and just laughing at us, you know. <laughs> oh, dear. Okay, cool. folks, and, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, uh, normally at this time, uh, we uh, have some networking and some beers. Uh, it's uh, something a bit hard to implement with coronavirus, but uh, hopefully that can change uh, soon. and. Uh, we can enjoy uh, an upcoming meetup uh, with beer and some networking afterwards. Would be awesome, definitely. Great, then thanks everybody. Nick, enjoy yeah, your and uh, let's keep in contact. Indeed, as always, my friend. It's been a pleasure. Bye bye. Later.